Hi guys, it's Reagan and welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be my November wrap up. Now for the month of November, I'm not gonna lie, my reading was all over the place. I was fighting for my life against a reading slump. And yes, I still read books, but it took me forever to one, finish books, even if I was enjoying them. And also just like figure out what in the world I wanted to read. Luckily, I do feel like I've shook off this reading slump, I've, I've made it through. But that being said, I definitely didn't quite read as much as I was hoping for the month of November. I finished six books and I got through two others, so I have eight books to chat about today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. The first book I was able to complete for the month of November is a beloved book. I've had this book on my shelf for years and I decided to pick it up just because of all of the glowing praise and reviews, hoping that it would help jumpstart my reading. And that book is Circe by Madeline Miller. I've read The Song of Achilles by this same author, but this is a reimagining, reinterpretation and humanization of the well-known tale of Circe, who is a witch who lives alone and in isolation on an island. In this story, we follow Circe as a young child. We see her grow up as an immortal, surrounded by family and courtesans. They're out of their way to ignore her or treat her poorly. We watch her as she has this soft spot for humans throughout her entire life, constantly seeking out towards others, wanting to feel more, have connection, and kind of just live a different life than many other immortals around her. And there we watch her as she is banished to her island, meet a variety of travelers who wash up on her shore, and also take on the mantle of the witch that we sort of know her to be from the Greek myths and tales that I personally read since a young age. I really enjoyed this book. First and foremost, Madeline Miller has such a skill at kind of bringing forth tales and stories that we're super familiar with. A lot of this book is ripped right from the pages of the Odyssey, but reframing them and making us read these stories from an entirely different point of view, making us rethink and reinterpret various character interactions, and just in general humanizes so many different elements of these well-known stories. The characters are the same, the events are the same, but the feeling that you come away with is entirely different, and I just feel like she does such a fantastic fantastic job of this, not only in Circe, but also the Song of Achilles. I do want to say a trigger warning for a multitude of abuse that is present within this book. This is a dark read. Circe's life is not an easy thing to read. Her retribution and violence is also both satisfying and horrifying to read. And in general, her journey as an immortal character through time, I also feel like was captured really well. Time is an interesting thing to play with when there's an endless amount of it. And I do feel like the timeline of the story still felt very logical and easy to follow as it progressed, even if there was thousands of years that elapsed over the course of this novel. Circe as a main character rooted this very, very well. This is definitely a very feminist story through and through. We are reading from Circe's point of view, rooted in her experience as an immortal woman, but also we are constantly evaluating and understanding the stakes of having different types of power, what it means to have your power perceived in certain ways. We see Circe as a lower rung immortal and what that means that she has to interact with other immortals. But we also see Circe as she interacts with humans and where she is on the ladder of power in that particular relationship. This book is really fascinating and I honestly think very, very beautiful. I loved being in Circe's mind. I loved watching her story unfold and I just loved the new perspective I have on this tale that Madeline Miller was able to provide for me. I can see why this book is very popular and very beloved and I personally really enjoyed it and I would give it like a 4.25 out of five stars. From there, I probably picked up one of my favorite books of the year and by far one of my favorite fantasy reads of the year. It absolutely blew me away in every way, shape, and form and that book was The Spear That Cuts Through Water by Simon Jimenez. Everything about this book was an absolute knockout from the writing style to the structure to the concept to the story to the characters. Everything about it was incredible, wholly unique, and the entire experience of this book I just want to read it over and over and over again. I've read nothing like it. The Spear That Cuts Through Water is an intricate, multi-layered storytelling experience. We are both reading from the main characters and the cast of this epic tale, but we're also experiencing the process of the story being told itself. First, we are our main character sitting in the kitchen of his grandmother as she recounts this tale to him and the story of his ancestors. From there, we watch our main character begin to tell this story to others in his life. Also, as he enters the sort of in-between place, this theater where he is present in the audience, watching again this story untold in front of him. This book is supposed to try to capture the experience of oral storytelling and it does that perfectly. I cannot tell you how immersive this experience was reading this book, how beautiful and intricate and how perfectly accomplished this sort of multi-layered storytelling experience was. I 
loved it. And all of this is completely aside from the fact that the story that we are being told, that we are telling, that we are listening to was also incredible and fascinating in every way, shape, and form. So it's like a knockout on two fronts. And that story that we're being told is that of a journey taken on by two young men as they race across the land of an empire, as they're transporting a divine entity to freedom, chased and pursued by the sons of the evil emperor. Basically, it is a story of the beginning of the end of this empire, rebellion, revolt, and change is in the air. And the story of these two young men is just a delight to read. And while this is a story full of action and adventure and family, it's also a love story right down to its bones. And it was just a beautiful thing. Like, again, I really cannot emphasize enough how much I loved this book from the writing style to the concept, to the story, to the characters. I just felt pulled in and I fell in love with the entire experience of reading this book. This was an easy five out of five stars for me. I loved it. I will be talking about and recommending this book for the rest of time. It is just amazing. From there I decided to pick up a very beloved sort of romantic leaning fantasy story and that is A Far Wilder Magic by Alison Saft. I heard this described as like romantic fantasy meets full metal alchemist fan fiction and basically say no more. I was delighted by this book. It was very entertaining, very cute, very charming, and of course had all of the heart swelling moments you could ever want when reading a story like this. But this book is set in kind of a murky turn of the century historical setting. In this world, there's also magic and it takes its form within the practice of alchemy. In this story, we are reading from and following our two main characters. The first is Margaret and Margaret lives in a small town in a kind of remote house with her mother. Her mother though is an alchemist and is constantly leaving home in search of finding all of the answers to her unending like alchemic questions resulting in Margaret kind of living a very lonely existence, craving for her mother to kind of see her and stay with her and also having to deal with the town that often ostracizes her because of her cultural and religious background. The other main character we follow is Weston who is training to be an alchemist. He lives in poverty with his mother and sisters who he loves dearly dearly and he dreams of being able to secure himself a stable position to be able to take care of his mother and his sisters. Though Weston is running out of options, every single alchemic apprenticeship that he has has ended abruptly and he is down to his last possible teacher and that is Margaret's mom and he ends up on Margaret's doorstep. They both immediately take a strong dislike to one another but they are forced to kind of form an unlikely companionship and alliance with the beginning of a competition that is taking place within Margaret's town. Basically, a mythical creature sort of arrives out of nowhere, resulting in the beginning of a very famous hunt, a competition that occurs where a huntsman and an alchemist team up, and whichever pair can take down this magical being not only wins a large sum of money, but is able to keep the creature itself. Both of our main characters are interested in participating and team up to do so within this competition. They also begin to work closely with one another. They also begin to share some of their feelings and thoughts about their family. I really enjoyed the story. It's a classic pairing of very charismatic boy with very quiet and closed off girl and seeing them slowly begin to form a bond was truly delightful. I really enjoyed the alchemic element of this book. I feel like it walked the perfect line of like science and magic and there was lots of information and I feel like it created great like fantasy ambiance. The competition of this book too, while straightforward and not necessarily like really heart pounding, I do feel like really successfully drove this plot forward and kept it in entertaining and allow different scenarios for our characters to interact and have to work with one another. I really liked this book. I loved the character interactions and their dynamic. I enjoyed the setting. I enjoyed the dialogue and a lot of the commentary the author included within this story too. It's really about two lonely characters reaching out for connection and finding it with one another. It was romantic and a little bit fantastical, which I feel like is the perfect combination. I would give this book like a four out of five stars. It was so entertaining. The next book I picked up, I was seeing around as a charming Cozy read, and that is The Wishing Game by Meg Schaefer. Conceptually speaking, I really thought I was going to enjoy this book quite a bit as I found the synopsis to be the perfect mix of peculiar and again, heartwarming. In this story, we follow our main character, Lucy Hart. And Lucy Hart has grown up with a love for a collection of children's stories that have been so popular for many, many years, but the author kind of mysteriously stopped writing them and he's become a recluse on his island home. Fast forward, Lucy is now an adult and 
and she has kind of been struggling to make ends meet. She works as a teacher's aide and she dreams of being able to go to school, but she can't quite afford it at the moment. But more than anything, she wishes to have the opportunity to adopt a young boy at her school. But again, because of her financial situation, it makes this reality very, very difficult to occur. However, though, everything sort of changes for the better. And Lucy is presented an opportunity by the author of her favorite childhood book series to travel to his island and basically take place in a competition where the winner gets the unpublished manuscript of his final book within this series that they then can auction off for a large sum of money. Lucy goes, seeing this as an opportunity to not only start a new life for herself, but give her the means to adopt this young boy who she dreams of being able to provide a home for. I think on the surface, I enjoyed the inputs of this book. I liked Lucy as a main character. She was very easy to root for, not only in her life, but in the competition itself on this sort of strange and peculiar island of this author. But at the same time, though, I feel like this book was full of a lot of really complicated and emotional topics. And I felt that the author just didn't necessarily give enough time to develop the like emotional weight of these things. And therefore, I just felt that it was maybe a little too simplistic of a representation for some very serious things. I found the romantic connection between Lucy and the main male protagonist to be interesting, and I liked seeing how that was explored. And, and I also really enjoyed the sort of childhood author, his whimsical and quirky book, and how that left an influence not only in our main character's lives, but a lot of other people too, and seeing his home and the island that he lives on. It was like a really fun place to explore, very Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory-esque. But at the same time though, I struggled with this book because of the pacing and also just the amount of time given to what I feel like are very important and impactful topic. And while they did make us feel perhaps emotionally connected to a variety of characters and rooting for them, I also don't know if enough time was given to those very heavy topics to flesh them out and also provide the appropriate amount of context and weight to sort of give those topics the amount of respect they needed from my point of view, particularly with the adoption storyline and elements of trauma from Lucy's past as well as some of the other characters' past. I just feel like everything was brought up and addressed very, very quickly and some of the relationship dynamics I'm not sure were handled in the most appropriate way. But again, this is just my perspective and my point of view, not necessarily like objective truth. And in general too, I just feel like the pacing of this book needed to be reevaluated. I think it needed to be longer. For example, I feel like the romance in particular felt very, very rushed and even the competition, I felt like it started and ended almost immediately. There was a lot of exposition, which I didn't mind, but then the middle and conclusion of this novel was like over in a blink of an eye. So in general, I just feel like I had some problems with the pacing of the story and the time and weight that was sort of given over to some very important topics. But again, this is just my perspective and point of view. Overall, I would give this book like a 2.5 out of 5 stars. The next book I completed has to be one of the weirdest books I've read in a while. The thing about this book, I can honestly say I had no idea where it was going, what was going to happen, what the characters were doing, what their motivations were. It was a ride to say the least. And that book is The Library at Mount Char by Scott Hawkins. This is definitely a book you're either going to love or not get at all. I'm still trying to decipher my own feelings in terms of what I even read, but the ride of this story is like, like nothing else I can even explain. It is so bizarre, so absurd, so over the top and violent. It was just like relentless and at the same time compulsive because I've just never really read anything like it. But to take a step back, this is a story where in which we're following our two main characters, Steve and Carolyn. Carolyn, again, one of our main characters, has been raised by a figure known to her as God. In this vast and never-ending library, she has spent the majority of her life basically researching and learning her particular topic that she was assigned to by her father, who is a God, and that topic is languages. At the beginning of this book, she and her other siblings believe that something has happened to her father, and they're trying to figure out what that is, and kind of like save the day. So Carolyn goes out into the world of humans and interacts with an individual called Steve and brings him in to the full to try to solve this mystery. This book is so layered. Like even just that brief synopsis only is like the tip of the iceberg of this particular experience. <laughs> and I do want to say this book probably has every single trigger warning out there from violence to abuse to assault. So much happens. But I will also say I think I liked this book. I had no idea what was going on. I felt trying to understand the world, Carolyn's world, the magic and the powers that exist within her universe 
was really interesting. I appreciated that it felt off the wall and confusing. I liked that I was just sort of barely piecing things together as I went along. I felt a lot of kinship to the other regular human characters sort of drawn into the fold of Carolyn and her siblings' life. It is absurd to say the least. And I honestly think just going into this book and experiencing what it has to offer is what you should do. It is horrifying. It is shocking. But again, I had no idea where it was going and that was very satisfying in terms of a reading experience. And in general, I really liked kind of where it went and how it wrapped up, but I would give it like a 4.5 out of five stars. Speaking of a brutal book to read, <laughs> the last book I was able to finish for this month was Best Served Cold by Joe Abercrombie. Wow, this book was a lot. <laughs> From page one to the very end, I was disturbed, fascinated, and just couldn't put this book down in true Joe Abercrombie fashion. This is a standalone novel set and released between the First Law trilogy and then the later trilogy that Joe Abercrombie has written. It is a story that I believe can read like separately. You can technically start here and then go back. I will say there will be some mild spoilers to the First Law trilogy, but you can technically start here. In this book, we're introduced to our main character, Monza, and Monza at the beginning of the story is betrayed by her benefactor. From there, you watch Monza as she pulls herself from the depths of unending pain and begins to create around her a ragtag group of individuals to get her revenge. There are seven men in this world that she is going to take care of no matter what, and she will do anything to get their heads at the end of this story. This book appears perhaps on the surface like, oh, a ragtag group of individuals. I love a found family um, sort of underdog story taking on immense power to get what they want. And in a way, this book has elements of that, but this is not a story of like a beloved cast and crew. You will hate everyone in this book in different ways at different times, including your main character, Monza, but you will also be fascinated by everyone. And at times they work together with some camaraderie, which you like, but at other times it is the most toxic situation that makes you want to just ram your head against the wall because it's so wild to read. It is the most toxic situation in the entire world. This book is brutal in every capacity, perhaps even more brutal than the First Law trilogy, which I didn't even know was possible. I was cringing. I was covering my eyes. Joe Abercrombie's ability to create characters you're both equally fascinated by, sometimes like, and also horrified by is like a very unique skill and talent to him. The characterization and the journey of all of these characters you're reading and experiencing from in the standalone novel I also thought was rather commendable. I loved learning about people's backstories, where they came from, and kind of how they got to where they are today for better or for worse. The story of revenge is also one I really appreciated Joe Abercrombie's approach of. I think oftentimes we get this sort of glamorized, story within fantasy, even if it has like horrific elements, it's still like rooted in characters and motivations that we feel like are commendable. But this story is constantly playing with your sense of morality. You are disturbed by the choices that people make. And at the end of the day, Monza and the characters she has brought around her are probably all on other people's lists of seven people who deserve to die. And it just sort of makes you think about this endless cycle of violence that exists not only in Monza's world, but in this fantasy world in general. Twists and turns of the plot were very entertaining, but man, I was horrified by this. I was horrified by some of the directions the characters took, the decisions many characters began to take. Monza as a main character was a very fascinating character study about like the corruption of revenge and violence and how other characters began to be like a physical manifestation of her own internal corruption. It was a lot to deal with, hard to read, but also so unbelievably entertaining and well done. I really liked this book and I would probably give it like a five out of five stars. If I'm being honest, I like Joe Abercrombie quite a bit and he did the dang thing with this. And then the last two books I'm just going to quickly touch on because I'm still in the midst of both of them. Again, I had a bit of a chaotic reading month and I was pulled in a lot of directions. I just went where my reading mood took me. The first book, I have no idea why I haven't finished because I honestly was loving the first 50% that I did read. And that is The Hexologist by Josiah. Bancroft. I 
was anticipating this book so much. Josiah Bancroft is one of my favorite writers. He wrote the Send, Lin, Ascend series. He just has this ability to have these adult fantasy stories and have such a whimsy and cleverness about their plots and settings. But this book is set in a fantasy world and in a city that's sort of going through a large amount of change, kind of like an industrial revolution situation. There's also magic in this world and there are four uh, schools of magic. The first is like a traditional elemental wizard. We have alchemy, we have necromancy, and we have hex Mythology. After a very brutal war though, most of these magical schools have been limited and their power has been greatly reduced, uh, again to sort of prevent the violence that occurred within that war. All schools have been impacted by this except Hyxology, which is kind of the most forgotten about School of Magic. And our two main characters in this book are both Hexologists and they're also sort of like private detectives for hire. At the beginning of this book, they're approached by the royal kingdom uh, because the king is basically trying to bake himself into a cake and no one knows what is going on and the results of this could result in like huge political upheaval and though our two main characters are very anti-royalist and very anti-establishment they decide to take on the case because they're concerned about the repercussions to the city itself this book is just so clever. I love the dialogue and the characters. It's funny and strange and imaginative and just the world that the author is able to create is such a visual experience. It's just charming. It's weird. I love it so much. I love figuring out the mystery. I love learning about how this world works and I love the love and the camaraderie between our two main characters who are husband and wife. Even with all that praise though, I only read 50% of this book before I moved on to something else. I can't really tell you why because clearly I was really enjoying it. My hope is to finish it this month because it could be honestly a favorite book of the year. It just has so many inputs that I personally enjoy very, very much, and I'm excited to see how this mystery is going to resolve itself. The other book I was able to read, I read about 100 pages of before the end of the month, and that is He Who Drowned the World by Shelley Parker Chan. This, of course, is a sequel to She Who Became the Sun, one of my favorite books of the year when I read it a few years ago, and this was the highly anticipated sequel that came out this year. And while I've only read 100 pages, I can say with my full heart that this book is so good. And in fact, might even be better than the first one I read within this duology. Everything about the characters, the historical setting, the concept, the plot line, even the dash of fantastical elements of this are just so good. This book is set in 14th century China. We're following a variety of characters involved directly or indirectly with a rebellion uh, to overthrow the Mongol rulers of China of this time period. We follow lots of characters all vying for power in their own way and also like seeking their own power in their own way and station. This book is just fascinating. Not only, not only is the military combat strategy, actual war that is happening within this so well written, but the character study and character dynamics within this book is like on another planet. You could write essays about the characters you're reading from within this story. They're all fascinating and heartbreaking in their own way. Gender and queer identity is a huge part of this book and deeply influences not only how the characters move within this world, but how the world treats them as well. This book is about war, identity, love, betrayal, heartbreak, and it's so good. Um, but yeah, I've only read 100 pages, but these 100 pages have knocked my socks off. I will be finishing this book in the month of December. I am just obsessed, to be quite frank. I am loving this book. Alrighty guys, those are all the books I read in the month of November. Please let me down below some books you've read recently as I would love to know, and I will see you soon with another video soon. Goodbye!